of Nebrasaka High School. We also have University of Debrecen. We also would like to thank British University in Dubai. We also have Youth for Christ. We have 3F Striders Dubai. We have Centrist. We also have University of the East. We have PUP. We also have Amity University. We also have Al Ain School. We also have James Winchester School Dubai. We have the Yar International Private School. We also have OCR Nation. We also have International Philippine School in Jeddah. We also have American University of Sharjah. We have CEGP. We have San Beda University. We have Filipino Computer Club. We have Desert Voices Toastmasters Club. And the last but not the least, we have the Filipino Social Club, Youth and its members. So once again, I would like to thank everyone. And of course, I would like to encourage you all to suggest, no? You can suggest whatever the topics, whatever the subject that the philosoph, the philosoph youth can help you. Because uh, there is a saying that we must not stop learning because learning is a process. I hope we believe on that. You agree? Right? That's great, no? And also, I would like to thank to your parents, to your teachers that I communicated and they, they are very, you know, active and they are very responsive. And uh, lastly, I would like also to, give, uh, let me take this opportunity to give you a reminder that let us commit to win against this pandemic. So every time we go out, we should wear masks, okay? We should wear our face mask. If you saw somebody who wanted to go out who don't have any mask, just advise them to wear a mask and you have to be very careful. Once again, thank you very much. Welcome to our webinar and I hope to see everyone soon and I hope to see everyone with our future activities in the Filipino Social Club. And lastly, do not forget to follow our page and share our page, okay? Because we are live all over the world. And one more, I would like to thank the government of Dubai, Community Development Authority for the permit and this opportunity that we can share to the students, to the youth all over the world. Maraming salamat and mabuhay tayong lahat. Okay, thank you very much, uh, President Erickson, for the nice words. So now, we will be uh, introducing the lecturer or the speaker for today. Well, the speaker for today is, uh, is an expert in photography, of course. He is still a level graduate, uh, grade 13 graduate with a knack for photography and videography. Of course, uh, the, uh, she, he is a photo editor. Of course, he, he was the editor of the Prime Minister's Office Events, also the editor of the Dubai Women's Establishment Events. He is also at, uh, covered the telecommunica Telecommunication Regulatory Authority Events and Ministry of Health and Prevention Events. Of course, he is also a poet on site. He covered the Emirates Diplomatic Academy International Conference, the Executive Office Meetings in Dubai, the Prime Minister Office Oscar Biscan Delegations Workshop, and the Special Olympics World Games 2019. Of course, he has conducted some photo video coverage. These are live coverage. The live blood concert in Sharjah Expo Center, the Youth for Christ Sports Festival, the Martin Nibera and Lani Mesalushi World Alliance Concert in Dubai. And of course, he's the official photographer of all the events of the Sharjah International Book Fair in the year 2016 and 2017. And now, of course, uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Colin Dale Sablan Torres. Let us welcome him. Colin? Hello, hi guys. Um, let me just 
spotlight myself real quick. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I can see a lot of people here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, actually, Tito, for that wonderful introduction. So, hi guys. Um, I think that <laughs> I'm a bit caught off guard with that introduction. Actually, I didn't expect my um, my short, albeit short, career to be um, showcased. But hey, yeah. Um, of course, before I begin. Major shout out to all the people who have come, especially for our multinationals here. Um, thank you for supporting our social club. We are trying to, um, here in the UAE, we're trying to show more of our presence, especially since, you know, how it is here. And so this is just one of our ways to um, connect with everyone. And as for the youths, of course, I will be one of the one of the people here who will be helping you all out. So for the Filipino schools who are, you know, participating today, thank you so much for coming. I hope to see more of you in our future events. So allow me to first at least share a little bit more about myself. I think just the career part isn't really that, you know, that big. So um, first of all, my name is Colin, right? obvious and um, I've been in the UAE ever since I was very young so I grew up here all my life and photography has been a part of that actually for about half of it so you can say I started when I was 10 years old so it's been I've been a part of this world for an extremely long time and it was only recently when I took it to the next level I started to see it as a career choice and then now I'm trying to pursue a path to well, working on my passion and really enjoy what I love doing and trying to be of service to everyone around me. So consider this, of course, one of the ways that I can give back to the community. So thank you so much for each of you who are here. For those who are watching in Facebook Live uh, and wherever, um, please hold on. I know it might lag a few times, but uh, yeah. Um, Let's go. Without further ado, of course, let's get started. So uh, time check, everybody. It is 3.42 p.m. So I will aim for us to be done by I'm doing my math right before 6 p.m. All right. So bear with me, everyone. We're going to be talking about photography. I will try to explain it as the best I can. Uh, maybe around in the middle, we can have a short Q&A just to consolidate all of our ideas and I can you know, help you all out, right? So I'll be speaking in English the entire time. This is my mother language, it's my first language, Tagalog, Filipino. <laughs> uh, it's, it's somewhere there, I can understand. But for the sake of everyone here, to make sure everyone can really understand what I'm trying to say, this will be in English. All right, so without further ado, let us begin, okay. So allow me to share my screen. All right, can everyone see this? Yes, oh. sir. <laughs> you don't have to call me sir, but that's all right. I, I respect that, thank you. All right, so um, of course today we will be talking about photography, right? And as an outline of what we'll be talking about today, we'll be talking about a little bit of history, camera and image theory, parts of the camera and types of cameras. So as what Tito said earlier, today we'll only be talking about this stuff and we're gonna be dividing our entire session into two. So next week on Friday, I think around the same time, if I'm not mistaken, we'll be talking more about exposure, composition, how to take a good image, what makes a good image. And of course, at the end of it all, always just having fun. So today, of course, um, just keep it as a mental note, or actually it would be even better if y'all had a notebook with you, or a pen, or a notebook and a pen, not or a pen, and a pen, so that if there's anything that y'all might be, you know, I think we have enough noteworthy stuff that we'll be talking about today. So hopefully y'all can enjoy the ride with me as we, um, well, go about our day to day. Okay, so first of all, what is photography, everyone? So this is an open question to the chat and everyone here. Um, I think I'll just open this up for like one to two minutes. So um, I'd just like to ask everyone here, if you want, maybe we can have our microphones open for this. To so anyone who wants to volunteer, I'll just leave this question out here. What is photography? Like, what do you know? Or how can you explain photography in your own words? Uh, 
A profession of capturing pictures. Oh, all right. Wow. I like that. Who who was that? I couldn't, I can't exactly see who's speaking. So uh, may I know who you are? Adam Barretos. All right. Thanks, Adam. Okay, cool. I like that. It's a profession. Very nice. Uh, what else do we have? Do we have anything else from anyone else? It is an art. Or pra art. practice of taking photographs. All right, that's I like that as well. And who, who has given us this beautiful answer? This is Teacher Veronica Nader. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it is an art form. Very nice. I love it when people look at photography as well as an art form. So thank you so much. And maybe we can just have one more, um, one more, one more answer for this question. Um, a, a way of expressing yourself. Wow, all right, expressing yourself. Yes, I think that is an understated form. People might usually think photography is closed off to you know, professional stuff, but of course, photography is also an art form and you can express yourself. And who gave us that answer as well? Um, Althea Joanna Hablado. All right, thank you, thank you, Althea. All right, so, um, from the answer that we got, a profession, so we looked at it from the logical side and where it's used practically, and on the other side, which is an art form. And I think, uh, before we continue, uh, there, let's just get one thing straight. Photography is a beautiful world where you do combine the sciences and art all into one, right? We can get to how, to how that actually is in a bit. So I think what makes it so interesting is how you can cater to so many people, to those who are really into physics and math and you just want to solve problems. Photography is one way because there's a lot of concepts that you can really learn. And as an art form, well, I think it's enough. You can see Instagram and everywhere else. There are so many photographers out there who have really um, made their mark on the world and really showcased a lot of who they are, what society is, and well, how lifestyle is throughout history. Photography has been a way to like capture still moments. And I think as we move forward, we can learn just a little bit more. So yeah, guys, uh, strap yourselves in because I'll also be learning alongside you as we um, go with today. Okay. Next. All right. So literally or where photography actually came from, I think it came from, as I look through my notes here, it was been coined by Mr. John Herschel back in the, or it's usually attributed to him back in the 1800s. And photography stands for, or was derived from the Greek words phos and graph, which stands for light or, or light and drawing and writing the same time so that means right uh, maybe you must have heard for those who are a bit younger uh, in class maybe you've heard of photosynthesis right so how plants get their you know their 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 food right so at the same way the photo part of photosynthesis means light so you can attribute this to photos and everything else so just remember that the word photo deals with light so if you hear anything out there if it's photo at the start it's dealing with light. So for me, however, um, the way that I like to see what photography is, is that you get to paint with light to make it more of an art form, right? Photography isn't just only a profession, which I know a lot of people can say that it is, right? It's not only a profession, it's an art form as well. So take it from me, guys, paint using photography. It's so much fun, you know, all right. Okay, so uh, earlier, uh, earlier in our history, a very long time ago, before, before we are walking around with cameras, DSLRs, film, and everything, from the very beginning, during, um, pre I won't say prehistoric eras, but um, the people from before have noticed that in their darkened rooms, in their huts or wherever they're staying, there are usually little openings that are you know just around just because they're not made you know to last too long so when these openings are there and if you can imagine that there's no light entering in elsewhere just a dark place where they're in when light enters through they were noticing some weird images forming on the other side 
and it was kind of noted down over the years by some people from China, some people from Egypt, and you can call, you can basically call them like the first photographers. Why? Because they were trying to somehow preserve the images that they are somehow seeing. So maybe they were like seeing some camels, maybe they were seeing some people, and they were able to see them somehow through this light that was entering through that small little opening, right? Keep it in mind. Um, everything that I'll be talking about today are going to be interconnected. Excuse me. All right, so you guys have to kind of keep up and remember what I'm trying to say. I'll try to make it easy to understand because I know we have we have a couple of younger people in the audience, audience, classmates, or <laughs> classmates. Oh, that's nice to say. Yeah, our classmates. <laughs> Yeah, we have a bunch of uh, younger people here as well. So I'll try to have it. I'll try to make things as easy to understand as possible. All right. So throughout, throughout the history of photography, there were many influential names. So I'll just go a couple of them and what they have contributed for us in, well, where we are now. So first off, I would like to talk about Aristotle. So the famous Greek philosopher who was behind so many theories that we are now using. Um, ethics, religion, and all sorts of stuff. Whoa, oops, oh, little teaser. <laughs> so Aristotle's idea that he was able to map out in his writings were when there was a solar eclipse that was happening around those times, he noticed that he was able to watch it from the comfort, okay, I won't say comfort, but basically where he was, there was an opening in the ceiling. Maybe you might have seen it in some documentaries where in Roman times, in order for them to light up the inner, the inner hallways, they had to open up, or not open up, they had to leave the ceiling open in order for them to light things down. So similarly, what Aristotle was able to do, he was able to watch a solar eclipse. Whoa, he was able to watch a solar eclipse, but how? The solar eclipse image was being formed on the floor from the opening in the ceiling. So he was able to write that down, but there wasn't really much for him else to go on. He couldn't really explain why he was able to watch a solar eclipse. Because guys, just so you know, public service announcement, we don't see it here in the UAE, but if there's ever a solar eclipse, please do not look directly at it. You can get blinded. There's a lot of concentrated light around the edges of a solar eclipse. That's when, you know, the, the sun and the moon, I think, intersect and they go in front of each other. So all that light is going to be very concentrated on those edges and you might blind yourself. So please take care. If you ever want to watch a solar eclipse, do it carefully. All right, so next up is Mr. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the man behind all of these famous paintings that we see in art museums. Um, specifically, Leonardo da Vinci was not only known for paintings, actually, he was also known as an inventor or maybe an engineer as well. I'm not, not quite sure exactly, but I know that he was an inventor and he coined down, I'm using coined a lot, he noted down in his journals and writings how to use a specific concept in great detail and how we can use that concept in art. I'll get to that concept in a split second. So what he also noticed is that how that concept was so closely linked to how our eyes worked. So like how we perceive things, what are the things we are seeing in our daily lives, well, and how it really worked. And so what is that concept I made, or I showed you guys accidentally of what it actually is. That concept is called the camera obscura. All right, yeah, it's called the camera obscura. So you can take this down if you guys want to, it'll be easier for you all. Just keep a mental note, camera obscura. So what is the camera obscura? Camera obscura is translated into the meaning of dark room or dark chamber. Okay, so remember when I said of the, the tents and the huts of those from before, they're technically in an enclosed space and it's very dark, right? And those little openings were just letting just enough light in to be able to form some weird figures, right? Same thing with Aristotle. When he was trying to watch the solar eclipse, he, the place where he was at was pretty dark. And because there was just an opening in the ceiling, 
light was coming down from that solar eclipse and he could somehow notice that there was, well, there was an image being formed, right? So here's what a camera obscura is illustrated, all right? So as you can see, <laughs> as you can see here in the picture, we can see a darkened room, right? Or not darkened room, it's actually a box, right? We can see a box that is kind of open on one side and light is coming in through a specific place right? As you can see on the left side of the box, light is coming in through a very small opening. And on the opposite side, you would notice an image being formed. All right. So this is the concept of camera obscura. When an image is being formed on the side of a screen, when the light is entering through a small opening. Fun facts, guys, right? Pretty cool. I hope you guys are interested because we're going, everything we're going to be talking about today is relating to this very important concept, all right? So camera obscura, when light enters through a small opening, light enters and an image forms on the screen that is on the opposite side. All right, now, very important to remember that image that's being formed is in fact upside down and reversed. Whoa, why? <laughs> why is it, why would that be? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in order for me to explain first, I would like to show you guys a video I found on YouTube by National Geographic. Uh, I think I'll play it for like maybe a minute. So as I press play, press play, I wonder if this can be heard. I'll just close all of this. Um, yeah, hold on. There's no sound yet. Okay, there's sound. Is there sound? No, sir. Okay, it's fine. We don't need sound for this anyway. Just notice here that they're removing all the light sources from, from the room, right? So they're trying to enclose it, okay? And then now, like I said, they're going to make an extremely small opening. And through that opening, once they left the room, they were able to notice that an image was being formed of the outside and it was in fact inverted in the room. That's amazing teacher. <laughs> oh, I love you, man. That's awesome. All right. So um, as you can see, right, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Um, camera obscure is an amazing concept that has been with us from an extremely long time. And in order for me to really explain what is happening, we have to talk about a few physics concepts. So those of you who are kind of in high school, maybe getting into high school or out of high school, you know, it's just, we're gonna be going a little back in time or forward in time because we have a lot of people here who are uh, everywhere. And we're going to talk about light. So the way light works, light travels in a straight line. Let us understand that light doesn't really bend too much, doesn't bend, doesn't go in weird squiggly lines, zigzags, or okay, maybe zigzag because that's still straight, but it does still travel in a straight line. Okay, so in order for me to explain how this is happening, in this diagram, we can see that, even more examples of the camera obscura, in this dark box, maybe you guys can see this highlight. <laughs> Okay, so in this dark box, okay, from this object or subject that's outside, when light reflects off it, or let's say it's emitting light, for example, and when light reflects off this part of the subject, it will travel in a straight line, enter the hole, and hit the bottom part of the screen. Now, you guys are probably wondering, Kuya, teacher, if it actually travels in a straight line, why is it not straight? Or why is it not right side up? How come? Right? Because I, I had this question when I was younger. Like, how come? Why is it inverted? Like, okay, it travels in a straight line, but why is it inverted? Okay, let me explain to you why. Okay, so let's say this part of the leaf. Okay, we're going to be talking about a bit of angles here. So if it was traveling at 90 slash 180 degrees straight, okay, where would that light ray be hitting? Right? It would be hitting this part of the box, right? 
and if it's hitting that part of the box, nothing is, you're not going to see anything. No image will form. It's just, it's just going to hit it, right? Nothing's going to happen. However, if you start to, you know, draw imaginary lines and you notice at some point the light ray that is coming from or a specific light ray, if I were to make it more concrete, a specific light ray from this part of the object is traveling in a straight line at an angle such that it will hit the bottom part of the screen. Okay. Um, I hope this is, if there are more questions and answers, I'll get to them in a bit, but this is the basic concept that we have to understand that light travels in this way because of the opening that from the top part of a subject it will travel downwards and hit the bottom part, vice versa from the bottom. If it was traveling straight, it will only hit this part, but at an angle, it will go towards the top. Okay, just remember that. When an image is forming, it will be upside down and reversed. Okay, so another example of camera obscura here, from the hat, travels downwards, hits the bottom on the screen from his shoe, goes upwards, hits the top of the screen. If it was traveling in 90 or 80 degrees, it would just be hitting this side of the wall, right? And for D, it's going straight within and into the opening and it will just hit like you won't see that much difference but this is the concept that i want everyone to understand the concept of camera obscura within a dark room and from a small opening when light enters in an image would be formed on the opposite end or the screen and that image would be reversed and upside down cool all right, uh, I think my camera's over here. Hello. <laughs> All right, so uh, one more example here from maybe if you guys want to try it at home. Uh, I remember I tried an experiment in school in class when they gave me an opportunity to show them a bit of what I enjoy doing. And what I was able to do in my classroom, I didn't actually cut open our curtains. We had curtains on our windows. Uh, what I was able to do is I was able to just uh, push the curtains a bit to the side and let just a small amount of light in. And what we were able to notice is we were able to notice a kind of a blurred distinction or image of the outside coming into our room. We closed off all of our lights, of course, and everybody in the room was like surprised. Was like, what? <laughs> I remember seeing this uh, initially and when I had an opportunity to learn about it by through, well, through so many sources, my mind was literally blown. I was blown away by how light works. And it was from this that I really started to enjoy what photography really was because it was such an interesting concept. And the fact that you're just able to see it happen and you don't need anything complicated, like it's simple, dark room, small opening, image forming, right? Very interesting. So what we can also do with these images um, we can manipulate it in such a way if we enlarge the hole, something will happen to the image, maybe it will be magnified. If we start adding in glasses, right? For example, if we start adding things like a convex lens or to make it simple to understand a magnifying glass in that opening, right? Within the opening, right? We're using a magnifying glass within the opening. We can start to manipulate that image, right? And the reason why we can also use a magnifying glass is because a magnifying glass or a convex lens, as we can see in the diagram, it directs light in such a way where it converges, converge, okay, converge means to, to, um, to go towards a certain point downwards to converge into a specific point. So imagine this, if we were to place a screen or uh, a wall at this point, and we were trying to form an image, that image, because all of these light rays are being converged down to a point, would be in focus. New term, it would be in focus, or to make it easier to understand, once again, it will be sharper, all right? So maybe you guys are not thinking of it in your head like if we're using a convex lens, so isn't that also a lens? A camera lens? 
<laughs> all right, so I think now we're starting to connect all of our ideas together. So now you understand. So now as we move forward, sorry, now you understand the whole concept of camera obscura. Once again, dark room, small opening, light entering, image forming, upside down, reversed. Let's keep that in mind. Okay, so let's talk a bit about history. So in the 1700s, which I think is around the Renaissance era, uh, painters and writers alike have always been um, the way that they were gathering evidence or to eternalize something, eternalize, immortalize, cool words, kuya, omg. <laughs> In order for them to make things last longer, all the, the only medium or the only thing that they had was just like a canvas, paper, and it was only um, restricted to that, right? There wasn't anything else. You would only be he would only, if you were around that time, the only way that you would want to do, let's say you wanted a picture or a painting of your house, right? That's all the most you can get, nothing else. So there were so many, um, there were so many ideas that were floating around, but the only thing that we had, right, were paintings or writings in documents. So maybe you guys must have heard a saying that is kind of common nowadays, uh, pics or it didn't happen. Y'all uh, know who you are, guys. I won't say anything, but sometimes we really want to look for evidence in things. And so back then, the only things that we had were paintings. So the only way for us to have proof, of course, is to actually have them right in front of us and to be drawn or to be written in full form in our contracts with a signature, right? That was our only way, is Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, so um, over the course of history, when the camera obscura started to become more and more accepted and how should I say, dispersed around the world and people started to work a lot on it and it became more and more practical to use. As you can see now it's being, or in these pictures, the camera obscure from once used to be a large dark room has been made even smaller. Like as you can see in the center picture here, it's been made even smaller such that it can just be this small and it was able to direct light downwards. Now why it can be directed downwards? Well, there was also a use of some mirrors here and there, right? Some mirrors were being used and that are just some ways that light can be manipulated, right? So as you can see also in the right side of the picture, sorry, the right picture, that concept of camera obscura is so small. And what the artist was doing is that when light was entering through this opening, there's a mirror that is directing it upwards and onto, I think that's a, I think that was glass if I'm not mistaken. So technically an image was forming on some glass. So all you had to do was put some tracing paper or transparent paper, put it on there, right? transparent paper, put it on there, and then now you can start doing it. Guys, I know some people might say tracing is cheating, but here's the thing. If your intention of tracing is to um, try to capture exactly what is happening, then I think that that's not exactly cheating because, of course, painters from back in the day considered it cheating. It's not the best thing to do. You don't trace. Right? You really try to express yourself in your own way, copying other people's work. Even now is a big no-no. So yeah, so moving on. So of course, um, if there's one thing that was, if there's a question that was always being asked is if paintings were the only way to gather information as in evidence of a scene, how do we make it more easy to make because it's very difficult to be able to be to use this camera obscura concept and really capture every single detail from what you're trying to see onto a piece of paper or canvas it is extremely difficult why because it will take you a lot of time in order for you to get it as accurate as you can get it to be right so here's the question that, that uh, painters and inventors were trying to tackle is how do we make those images permanent, right? How do we make it easier for everyone to just, instead of 
painting it and using that concept to draw. Maybe you're trying to map out the house. Maybe you're trying to look at the park or anything like that. How do we make it permanent? How do we make it permanent? How do we make it forever to be, you know, used? <laughs> so firstly, I would like to make a big shout out to Mr. Joseph Nieps. Um, he was a French, French chemist, or you can call him a painter as well, but he was a chemist. And he was one of the people who was really so fascinated about the camera obscura and how light was able to form an image such that what he was doing is he was in his laboratory or in his area and he was trying to find out which chemicals once sensitive or once exposed to light will change or will react to it. There are only very few chemicals that are able to do that and Joseph Nieps was able to find that and with a bit of experimentation and a bit of use of metal plates he was able to create the very first photograph. So this is the very first photograph. It was made using metal plates and a couple of chemicals that I don't remember the names of, but we don't have to get into that in too much detail. All you need to know that this has been recorded to be the very first photograph. So as you can see, it's very rough, but what it actually was, it was a view from outside. I think it was his window and it was just, um, yeah, it's just like a landscape photograph, as you can see. However, I think one thing that we have to take note is that it took him eight hours. It took him eight hours for him to expose this metal sheet with chemicals, right? And one more thing, it didn't just take eight hours. It also took sunlight. And as we all know, sun or <laughs> the sun is, is a very strong light source. So it's not exactly the most practical, but there are always steps that we have to take in order for us to start something. There's always going to be the first step, and that first step is always going to be the hardest. But once you get the ball rolling, then everything will be easier, right? Life coach Colin, like, shout out to you guys. Okay, so next up, we have um, directly after the, directly after when Joseph Nieps was developing his concept um, directly after a newer, much easier way to record light, which is called the daguerreotype or the daguerre picture, was when instead of using the chemicals that he used, he used more sensitive chemicals in such that the exposure time didn't have to be eight hours anymore. It just had to be like between 30 to 10 minutes. So throughout the course of history, from the very first camera obscura, that concept is now being even more, you know, even more worked upon, right? Technology is advancing, guys. It's amazing from eight hours of exposure now down to 30, right? And now we have to talk about what comes next. And Mr. William Henry Fox Talbot is the guy who made such a major breakthrough. He was the guy behind what? I'll just say right now what he, what he did. So Mr. William Henry Fox Talbot was, of course, another chemist, and you can call him a photographer as well. And what he was able to find out is using a specific compound of silver and a halide, he was able to mix these chemicals up together and noticed that it was extremely light sensitive, that exposure time didn't have to be, didn't have to be as long, and he was able to form interesting images. Now, what are those interesting images? Well, those images are a bit different because he was forming using those chemicals of his own concepts, conceptualization, he was forming negative images. What is a negative image, Kuya? Let me tell you. <laughs> I swear, it, I really do feel like I'm talking to myself and it's like I'm vlogging, but uh, I hope you guys can bear with me. <laughs> All right, so um, where was I? Okay, negative images. So what is a negative image? A negative image is when the lighter parts of the original subject is made dark and the darker parts of your original subject is made to be lighter. Now, the only way for me to really explain this is if I have examples, right? So before I get into that, 
Mr. William Henry Fox Talbot's math or what he was able to think about and conceptualize and to really like push forward this idea is when he was able to create negative images, like I said, when the image, the image that you were forming on his chemical compound mixture, if it was formed in such a way that if the light parts are dark, the dark parts are light, what if we expose that image again onto another sheet of paper, we would be forming another negative. And if we think about it in such a way, if those light parts that became dark and we're going to apply the process again, so those dark parts will be made light again, in the end result, we will be getting a positive image. Whoa, math in photography? <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of math that's also being played. Um, a lot of math was also being played in the concepts of what we are using today. And what Mr. Talbot here was able to um, well, bring to us is the concept of how a negative image, once exposed to another negative um, film, you can say film or screen or piece of paper, a positive image would form. Right, and here's just an illustration of it. Would you consider yourself a person? <laughs> so as you can see here, um, his hair, originally his hair would be black, right? But in a negative image, what you are actually seeing is that his hair, which was originally black, once formed into a negative mixture or once once the image is being projected into a sheet with that negative mixture or that you guys get what I'm trying to say when it was being projected what you will end up seeing is an example of this his hair would instead be white his skin maybe the background is going to be black so if I were right if I were to be taken a picture of right now and it's a negative image my background would be darker or black this would be a bit lighter and my hair would be a bit lighter, right? Cool. Okay, so that's all we need to know. So this concept of course is how, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. So um, the next person we have to talk about is Mr. George Eastman and very influential and cool person in photography. I look up to this guy because he was the guy behind the very, interesting company of Kodak. Kodak was the very first photography company that has commercialized this concept to the world. They were bringing the world smaller camera obscuras or cameras and made it available for the public to use. Right? They, he made it possible or he was the man who made this interesting concept possible for the public to use. Okay, and this was his slogan, the slogan of Kodak, you press the button, we do the rest. So what Kodak was also very popular for, they were also the people behind roll film. So remember what I talked about Mr. William Henry Fox Talbot and his, uh, his mixture, right? So Kodak took that concept and made it so that he had film to be placed into the camera and that camera is now being sent off for everyone to be able to use. Photography now didn't have to be just for the rich and for those who are inventors and scientists and only for those who are capable. Now, what Kodak was able to do, he was able, he was able, they were able, <laughs> they were able to send this to everyone around the world, right? So if you guys see Kodak now and Kodak film cameras uh, out there, you guys have to give it to them. They have been a major part or they have played a major part in history and they were able to send off their cameras for all of us to use. This is an example of it. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's a huge box, right? Remember camera obscura, a dark room right here, small opening over there, right? Dark box, small opening. And yeah, this concept was being sent off to all of us. All right. It was amazing. So, Throughout the years, uh, this is, as you can see from this diagram or picture, throughout the years after Kodak has started to uh, become very popular for everyone, now everyone can become a photographer, 
no way you didn't have to be a painter you didn't have to be a scientist everyone can be a photographer so people were now starting to really use this technology and have some fun like photography is fun guys you don't have to take it too seriously even with your phones you know you're going on taking pictures it was it's very fun because you you're technically capturing or freezing time and i think having that type of power is pretty cool guys the power to freeze time pretty cool <laughs> so um this technology right as it started to develop even more um as you can see from this type of flow chart um, when cameras then after kodak started to really be popular uh, you would have your roll film you put it in your camera you play around with some settings take the picture take enough of them once your film is done or take enough of them until your film is done take it out send it off give it to whoever could be kodak could be a lab for them to develop your film and after your film is developed it can be made into different types of things that you would want it to be maybe you want it to be larger maybe you wanted it to be smaller you can do okay smaller is the wrong term because film is already small but you can make it into different types of sizes okay so here's just another example of how negative images are using film i think this is a okay for the enthusiasts out there who are with us today i don't know which film this is from but as you can see more negative images being formed on film. So now the concept of negative images, right, is being placed on the film. Okay, so everything is connected, right? Everything I've been talking about so far, they're all playing a major role from the camera obscura. And then now how film was able to allow us to make those images permanent, right? So this is what's happening. So from film, a negative image would be formed. And once you're done with the film, you give it off to the labs and what they're going to do, they're going to develop your film. So with a lot of chemicals here and there, they're going to like wash it and do a bunch of things. It's a very interesting topic, guys. I won't go into too much detail, but um, maybe in your spare time, you can look it up. It's really cool. You can play around. So maybe in those movies and um, some series out there, maybe you might have noticed in the film developing process, they like do a lot of washing and they do a lot of this. And then they even hang them in like, like clothes, like clothes strings, and then they put these, you know, those um, clips. <laughs> I'm, my, my mind is like, I'm running out of words to say, but yeah, you can see sometimes in those clothesline and they clip these photographs. So this is what's happening. There are chemicals being used. I won't go into too much detail about them, but that was how film was being developed. All right. So what you can do is after that film is developed, remember what I said from Mr. Talbot's process? So if you expose that negative film, once again, you can form true positive images. Isn't that cool, right? Once you expose that once very weird to see negative image again and into an enlarged like space, maybe you want it, I don't know, A4, right? So from film, if you expose that film again, you need the same concept of camera obscura. You're still in the dark room, right? When you're developing film, you don't need to develop it in like, you know, light, like in, light, in very bright uh, places. No, you are in a dark room again. You're going to have an opening. You're going to have light and you're going to expose that image again onto a piece of paper, right? It's always, it's, it's just connected, right? I, I feel like photography is just so interesting because once you know where it comes from, everything is just coming right before you. Like it's just all related. It's all interconnected. So now that you guys know what camera obscura is, it should be very understand. Oh, so that's how an image is being formed. So he just applied it again and that's how we're forming bigger images. Wow. <sighs> so of course, over the course of time from black and white, color was now being introduced into film. So different filters are being used and technology was just advancing very quickly, right? Very, very quickly. And then now uh, we are noticing and we are seeing that from film cameras, now we are shifting, right? From film cameras, this is now borderline the 1900s, so 1920s, 1930s is roughly, very rough number, is when now we're, we're going to enter the digital stages, okay? So now we have newer process entering, right? We have newer processes. So instead of 
instead of your film, now we are having stuff like memory cards. Like, what is a memory? You, if you go back in time and you ask people then, hey, this is what I use. I use this small chip, you know, this 128 gigabyte chip now can hold how many pictures, right? And then, and everyone back then will just be, huh? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, so technology has made a major boom over the past century. And even in photography, there was a large shift when that change started to come into camera. So instead of using film, now you were using sensors, RGB sensors, right? RGB sensors, so color. Um, the reason why it's RGB it's kind of a complicated physics concept. So to keep it easier to understand, the light that you are seeing, so white light, actually consists of different speeds. And it will be very complicated, but all you need to know is that white light is actually a combination of so many different light to form, to form the color white. Maybe, you, maybe to make it easier to understand a rainbow. Okay, yeah, I think that's easier. So if you guys have ever seen a rainbow, you are seeing, you are actually seeing the spectrum of light. In a nutshell, you're seeing the spectrum of light. So all of those colors in the rainbow combined will be white light. So just a food for thought, guys. So um, the reason why it's RGB that's being used in our sensors is these are, are easily distinguishable compared to, excuse me, easily distinguishable compared to like yellow, for example, or violet, like that is kind of too difficult to, to, you know, to make it easier to like to sense. So instead we are using red, green, and blue. So these are like different filters and things like that. So now we're, we're really coming into the digital part of where we are, All right? So um, now, Time check, everyone, time check. It is 4.30. So now we have reached our halfway point. Um, I will be allowing everyone to take a small break. So if you want to consider, or if you want to consolidate some of your thoughts, I think we'll take a break for like five minutes. All right, so if you guys want to stretch, five, okay, two, two to five minutes. If you guys want to stretch, drink some water, maybe grab a bite to eat. Like I'll give you guys that much time since we're now at the midpoint. And if you have any questions, I think the chat will be open, All right? So I'm gonna be going to the chat. So if there's anything, <laughs> so if there is anything, any question that you guys wanna ask me considering um, from the what we just talked about, so camera obscura and all these concepts, I will be uh, answering them. Can we stay in the meeting? Yeah, you sh it would be, of course, you guys have to stay, right? Just for like two minutes, you know, get up, stretch, drink, drink some water, go to the bathroom. You know, this is the time so that you don't miss anything. So yeah, so for me, it is currently 4.28 p.m. So um, maybe, maybe by, before 4.35, we'll, uh, resume. So if you have any questions, like write them down, or if you want to ask me now, like I'll be here. I was just gonna ask for some water. <laughs> so yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna chill for a bit. Like you guys want to check your phone, you know, do something. We chilling. We're chilling, guys. All right. Oh, thank you. Sir, where are you working right now? Where am I working? Um, working? <laughs> okay. Well, I, well, I wonder how old do you think I am? <laughs> I'm not exactly, um, I'm not exactly the eldest person, but if I were to keep it simple, uh, recently before the whole pandemic hit, I was actually uh, employed in a media production company. So it's based somewhere in the business bay. So if you, for those who are in UAE, y'all will know what it is, right? Y'all know where business bay is. And so it's a pretty high end thing. So what we were doing at my place, I was in charge of, or my role there was a photo editor. 
I was handling like photographs here and they're coming from our photographers. I didn't get a photographer role because I'm, as you can see, I'm pretty young and I'm considered a junior still. So uh, to be able to be a professional, I gotta really like show them my, show them my stuff. Uh, even though I believe that I am okay enough, I kind of know what I'm doing. Uh, that was kind of like my testing period. So um, because the pandemic hit, uh, that media production company that I was employed in took a big hit as well. So at the moment we're on hold and it's kind of, you know, so, so nothing much is happening, but yeah, um, that's where I am now. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. All right. So some other questions in the chat, I'm going to scroll up real quick. So from Edre, have you tried shooting film nowadays? Woohoo. <laughs> Um, to be honest, not really, but it has been an extreme. So ever since I started or I got this opportunity to be able to share with you guys this, uh, I was up in my, you know, up in my books and all the videos and stuff. And I started to really appreciate what film was and how much has really gone into that. So it's such a beautiful piece of history. And I really want to get into it. And it's to be fair, I do have film cameras at home as well. So the option is not there for me. I want to get into film photography again, because I was kind of into it before, but it was a bit too difficult because digital was easier, right? You didn't have to, um, you didn't have that restriction of not seeing what you're taking, right? But I think the true test of a photographer is to able to get it right in camera. All right. So I want to try it very soon. Or maybe uh, you can help me out <laughs> getting, getting into it. Uh, thank you. All right. So maybe I'll just answer one more question and then we can resume. Mm -hmm. The next question that I got over here in the chat. Do you have any knowledge about point and shoot film cameras from April? In? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I just answered that question in a way. Not entirely, but since I kind of am getting into it now, I think I'll be able to answer that question a lot better. But to keep it simple, point and shoot camera, what I just talked about, right? That's how it works, all right? If you wanna know how it works, camera obscura, film, change your settings, get the exposure right. We're gonna talk about that next week, all about exposure. But for now, at least you're aware of what is actually that camera all about all right cool and okay i think i have enough time for one more or two more have you ever created a movie i have not i am in fact a photographer kind of exclusively a photographer at the moment i haven't tried any motion film um of course it's in my realm of interest but i haven't quite gotten there yet i feel like i want to stick to this for now and really you know do what i can do here and for the last one what photo editor software you can suggest for beginners? Well, for beginners, it really depends on what you are trying to do, right? I think this question is a bit broad. If you were, if I were to tell you very simply, it's Instagram. Instagram already has most of the basics there. Maybe even Viesco, if you guys have heard this phone app, um, those two applications I have used for a while, and I think that it has enough features for you to kind of grasp and to change images in such a way where you want them to start. But of course, if you are starting to really take things seriously, go into Creative Cloud, shout out to Adobe for creating their beautiful softwares. That's the place to go. Okay, so we are reaching 434. So now uh, let us... I will answer the rest of these questions in a bit, in a bit. Camera using, wow, pretty cool questions. All right, I will answer them um, towards the end of our session today. So I hope you guys are still interested. Uh, those of you who are here, thank you so much for still staying with me. We have another hour. Uh, hopefully I can keep you guys entertained. Uh, I'm not exactly the funniest person in the world, but I'll try to answer some jokes here and there, guys. Give me some, give me some love, show some love. Uh, yeah, all right, so let's go back. Oh, 
Okay, so what we just talked about earlier, right? The camera obscura and all of these things. Now we are going to talk about where that camera obscura translated to today. Um, all right. So from the camera that we're now calling it, excuse me, the obscure part is now becoming obscure. Like we're now removing that part because we are just using the concept of the camera, right? No longer are we, you know, just forming images anymore. We're also saving them. So to make it easier to pronounce and tell everyone, I'm using a camera now. I'm not using the camera obscura, right? We're using cameras. So um, there are many similarities and different, <laughs> there are many similarities between a film and digital camera. Like I just explained when it started to shift to digital, the only thing that changed is the recording medium or what is, excuse me, or what is behind the screen or what is the screen? Remember when I said camera obscure and image was forming on the screen, right? So that's the only thing that changed. There are so many things that are still common, right? That are still common for a film camera and a digital camera. And of those, right, of those are these stuff here. So you have the lens, the shutter, the aperture, and the viewfinder, all right? So we're gonna talk about each of these in a little more detail accordingly. And hopefully maybe, I know some of you guys here are also photographers in your own right, so maybe you might learn something new that you haven't um, yet seen, talked about. And for those of you who are enthusiasts or just getting into it as a beginner, uh, hopefully I'm able to clear up some of the doubts that you might be having as we move on. Okay, so first is the lens, all right? So remember from the very beginning when I said that you can manipulate images from the camera obscura by using a magnifying glass, right? Use magnifying glass, okay? So um, a lens is basically the entry point of light into the camera, right? Instead of the hole, now we are using a lens. And within the lens, as I just explained, it has a series of glass or lenses, right? Where they manipulate light in such a way that it is reaching the end of your camera as how it's supposed to. I can go into very deep theory about this because it's kind of all physics related and I took physics in high school. So I kind of enjoyed it. I enjoyed learning about light and I can, I don't, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but all you need to know is that there is a lot of pieces of glass, right? There's a lot of pieces of glass in the lens. So I think I have a lens here that I can show you all. First off, just, you know, I have some props here, right? Right, so I have with me a lens, the Sigma lens, shout out to Sigma. All right, so as I remove the lens cap. So from the lens, right, uh, pretty self-explanatory now that I just explained it to you all. Over here, you can see all the, or if you were to look in, if you guys have your own lenses, you can start to notice that there are in fact a series of glass in tandem or unison inside, right? There's just so many of them. And that's why you, that's why like, um, okay, I'm losing words, but to keep it, to, to come back, uh, a lens is a series of lenses all packed up into one and is the entry point of light into the camera. Okay, so of course in the lens we have to talk about this feature that it has. So in a lens, remember when I said that because of all of those lenses that are being used, they converge light to a specific point. So that converging, you can also call it that focusing power, all right? The focus, right? Maybe you have heard of this term already. So all of those things that are converging that light into that specific point is focus. And because technology is advancing, these lenses are now having inbuilt mechanisms and it's now a lot easier. So autofocus is now a thing, right? So in some digital cameras that you will notice is you have these settings. Uh, I think we don't really have, I don't really have to talk about this too much, but in a lens, you can, or the lens that I had in particular is a manual lens, which kind of has autofocus features. But what you can do is you can manually set what you want 
to be sharp in the image, right? In your image that you're trying to capture. And from these settings here, while using the same lens, what I could do in terms of using the S part of your camera, uh, I don't have one with me at the moment to show you, but usually this would be around the bottom left. If you're holding your camera right here and you're showing the lens, it would be somewhere here. You can move this dial around and you can have these S and C settings. All these settings are just how your lens will be focusing. So by single, in this fashion, it means when you're trying to take a picture of something stationary, it's not moving and you're just trying to you know, focus it, you would be using the setting, the S setting. For continuous, <laughs> for continuous, for continuous, you would be using this autofocus feature when you have a moving body or moving subject in front of you. So for example, maybe it's a moving car, maybe it's someone walking, maybe it's someone running. So when you have your digital camera or film camera that has this setting, you know, be sure to use the C function, right? Um, very important, of course, it's a, bit, it's a bit dark anyway. So very important, of course, that we have to um, understand is that the lens is the entry point of light, right? So what you should always remember is to never touch it. Never touch it. Don't lay hands on it. It's just going to ruin what that image is going to end up like, right? Now, why is that? Now, remember, before I talked about Leonardo da Vinci, right? <laughs> I talked about Leonardo da Vinci and how he was able to um, see the similarities between the camera obscura and our eyes. So if we were, for example, to touch our eyes, right? Let's use that analogy. If we touch our eyes and we are able to leave fingerprints, we would be like, we would be seeing weird things, right? We can't really see things clearly. So likewise, in our lens, take care of it. Consider it your second set of eyes. Please take care of it. I need you guys to understand your lenses are very important. Um, some people say, or some photographers say, oh, you always have a good camera. It's like, oh, you know, I can't take good images, but let me tell you what, guys, it's actually the lenses that do all the work. It's not only the camera body. The lens does more work than your camera body. So moving on. Next, we're gonna be talking about the shutter. The shutter, now what is the shutter? The shutter is a piece of metal or plastic in your camera that will prevent light from reaching the film or sensor or recording medium. It will also allow you to control exactly when the picture will be taken. So imagine Okay, actually, I don't need you guys to imagine. All right, let me show you. All right, so with me, ah, with me, I have a very special camera that has been uh, given to me, or not given to me, but I have a chance to play around with it because this was actually my dad's film camera. It is the Nikon FM10. Uh, I think a couple of people here know this camera and have actually had a chance to use it. So this is a film camera, okay? So it uses film, right? There's no LCD screen, like as most cameras can see. And what I'll be showing you here, as I manipulate this real quick. Why aren't you opening? All right. Okay. All right, so as you can guys, as you guys can see, as I remove this cap, if I were to press this button after making it capable of doing so, okay, I think I can see that. So maybe I instead have my white background. All right. Did you guys see that? <laughs> Let me show you. So that, so what just moved up or what just went up in this film camera with me was the shutter. So what it actually does, it actually goes up whenever you want to take the image at that specific time. 
right? To those of you who might have had some doubts before, this is what the shutter does. It goes up when you want to capture the image at any specific time, all right? So um, what you can also do is you can also control how long you want that shutter to stay open, all right? If you want it to be long, you want it to stay open for maybe, I don't know, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, 10 seconds, <laughs> you can keep it long for a good period of time. Um, what I started to notice is, okay, I think you guys might've had some questions of what, where this can be used practically. So I won't be talking about that today. I'll be talking about that next week on Friday of how do we use all of these concepts into capturing our images, right? So just for today, this is just for you guys to understand what they are. So first I talked about the lens, entry point into the camera. You can focus, you can zoom, right? This one next up is the shutter. So it's like, how do we control the amount of light coming in, right? So um, what we can do, because we can kind of manipulate how light is entering our camera now, right? From the shutter of how long we want to expose our sensor or our um, film, right? We can achieve unique stuff. So if we were exposing our film or sensor for a longer period of time, we can start to notice motion blur, right? Motion blur. Now, why is that? Okay, for those of you who can understand what I'm trying to say, the reason why motion blur is happening is because when you open your shutter, that moving object is on one side, let's say it's on the left side of your, of your, of where it is, right? And while it's open, it will move a certain amount of distance, right? And once it closes, it will be in a new point. So what the film or sensor will detect is how much that has moved because light was reflecting from that object, right? So as it was entering, technically those light rays were like shooting, you know, laser beams towards your sensor or film and it was forming a straight line. Right? So that's why we can see motion blur. That's why we're seeing um, all of these cool images that we're seeing. Maybe we can see someone like, you know, running and then we see a bit of them behind themselves. And so that's where this is all coming from. It is how we use our shutter. So likewise, on the right part, side of the image, if we were using a faster shutter, so just a very short, a very short amount of time, you can freeze motion. So, the op so it's the opposite of capturing motion when you're exposing it for longer, you can freeze motion. Beautiful shot. I love shots like this, the ripples and stuff like that. Playing around with water is so cool because it's just a part of nature that we don't get to see, right? Pretty cool, guys. Uh, play around with water. It's very interesting. Let's move on. Okay, so next up, whoa. <laughs> All right, next up, we're gonna be talking about the aperture. So the aperture is actually the lens opening, all right? So how much of that opening really is? Remember when I said in the camera obscure, you can manipulate images, right? So the aperture or lens opening is that part, the enlargement, <laughs> the enlargement of the lens opening. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know I could do this with my hands. Wow, okay, I just found that out now. Somehow. <laughs> okay, so, um, to keep it, to illustrate that concept here, um, as you can see, it's usually placed either behind or within the lens, okay? So if I were to take that Sigma lens, where is that? Here with me, I can show it to you, all right? I'll, I'll explain the numbers in a second. But if I'm going to take this Sigma lens, Um, wait, before I do that, right? Can you see that opening over there? Right, you can see the piece in my wall, right? Oh. Right, so if I'm going to turn this, you can see it becoming smaller, right? That's extremely small. So basically the aperture, the aperture, I think I was away from my mic, but the aperture, right, is in fact seen behind the lens 
right? The very back, it's actually here. I can see it moving, right? From big to small. Maybe it's different if I, if I show you here, but I don't think so. Oh yeah, it is. Okay. So I think it's just easier to see. So this is when I'm using a smaller aperture number. And this is when I am using a higher aperture number. Right. Okay, so I know it's a bit confusing now because what we were understanding is that numbers are now playing a role here. So the only thing that you need to remember is when you are using a lower aperture number, excuse me, the lens opening will be larger. All right, you can note that down if you want to. A small aperture number, larger lens opening. So what it can actually allow you to do and so why we're using it at all is that it controls the brightness of your image, the general brightness. So if the, as we go back and talk about the shutter, if we're talking about the shutter, it controls how much light is entering in and how long you want to expose it, right? So in a way that's also controlling the brightness, but if you want to control the brightness much more, you would be using your aperture instead. So if you want more light to enter, if you want more light to enter, right, if you want more light to enter, use a larger opening. And it would be, um, it would be larger. All right. So um, I, can il I can show you guys like an illustration here. So whenever it's dark outside or whenever we're in a dark setting, we can notice that our iris, our eyes actually open up, right? It becomes more more dark and black. And the reason for this is because we're trying to allow more light to come in, right? So similarly, or in contrast, I should say, in contrast, when we're outside, our iris, right, really contracts and then it just becomes really small because the sun's light is just way too bright. So oftentimes we find ourselves squinting, right? In order for us to like kind of you know, traverse the outside when it's when it's too when it's too bright, right? So this is what's happening. So we can apply that concept into camera photography. So just so you guys remember, if you're using your digital cameras, you know, fun fact, little hack, uh, think about it like your eyes. So if you're outside, it would be better if you're using a higher aperture number because you want to use a smaller opening. Why? Because it's just way too bright when you're outside. So. I think the opening is small. All right. So um, I have some examples here of this little cat. So as you can see, eyes of the cat is in a dark setting. So its iris is very wide, right? So it's trying to let more light in in order for them to see. In contrast, when there's a lot of light, right? The iris of the cat will be, be like kind of pinched in. You can call it like, you know, when Toothless um, from How to Train Your Dragon like becomes this angry like type of guy you're like, wow. And then when he's, when he's like, uh, you know, trying to be cute or whatever and he just, his eyes just like, Pfft. right? Well, you know, same thing. <laughs> kind of the same thing, but yeah. Of course, it changes the images of the, it changes the appearance of the cat by a lot. So just a little, you know, fun fact, you can actually see this in people as well. So you know, bunch of picture theory, image theory and stuff like that. I won't get into too much detail, but you can really affect how a person looks like even by how much is seen in their eyes. Okay. So one more thing, it can also control the depth of the sharpness or for those who are more um, into photography, it is called the depth of field. Okay. So I'll have to illustrate that. By depth of sharpness, I mean in this image, as you can see, this part is sharper, right? Well, <laughs> this part is sharper. So that means that it's only in focus, right? And everything in the background is kind of blurred up. So the concept that is being or used here is the aperture. And why this effect is happening is the aperture is being played around with. So what is actually being used here? We are using a smaller aperture number. 
So that means we are using a larger, we're using a larger lens opening. Okay. Um, I know it's a bit confusing to think about, so I will explain all of this next week on Friday. So I really hope to see all you guys there. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, especially in exposure and how we get all of these cool effects. Uh, this is all done through cam. Okay, sure, the colors are played around with, but to get this effect, this blurred type of effect, it is very difficult to do this in like Photoshop or something. It is, it's hard. It's not easy. It's possible, not easy. So you can actually do this in cam, right? So I'll be talking about all of that next week, but this is what the aperture is able to do. You can manipulate the image in such a way that you just want a specific part to be, you know, noticed and everything else is just like, you know, like complementing elements. So similarly with the scissors, you can notice uh, out of focus, not really notice, you, you won't look at this first, you would look here first. It really plays a role in leading the eyes of the person. All right, so I'm just, you know, sometimes we have to squint. So just like our eyes, right? Whenever we want to look far away or we're trying to make things even clearer than what we're trying, than what it is, we try to squint our eyes, right? We're trying to, you know, make it, make it so that we're allowing just as little amount of light in just to really see what we're trying to, what we're trying to look at, right? Mm. Mm. Okay, so next, we're going to be talking about, I, we're almost reaching the last parts is the viewfinder, okay? So the viewfinder allows you to aim your camera and preview how much of your subject will be included in the image. So basically, it is your crosshair for those gamers out there. What's up, guys? It is where you are directing the camera, all right? So whatever you're seeing in your viewfinder, generally, I'm doing this form because it's the most understood one if your phone camera, right? Whatever you're seeing, you can consider that as your viewfinder, what you're trying to look at, right? You're trying to take a picture, aren't you? So that your view camera allows you to aim. Okay, so um, next up, I'll talk about like, a few different types of viewfinders and some more cameras. So now we're reaching about the end part of the, of the webinar things, all right? so viewfinders right have many different forms throughout the years and throughout history right so for example in this film camera i am hoping it is a film camera right <laughs> okay so in this camera the viewfinder is not exactly um in the same place of the lens right because i think one of the problems that photographers from back in the day were having now that they were able to record images is how do we really see what we're taking, right? Like how do we, how do we know what we're capturing is correct? Like, is it straight? Is it properly composed? Like, is it, you know, like that? So um, there were so many technologies and people were really trying to experiment. Well, how, how can we, you know, make this easier? So all, one of those ways is when they start to put these little holes in cameras. So for example, over here, we can see uh, it's just a bit above the lens. So they're trying to minimize, minimize. <laughs> they're trying to lessen, they're trying to lessen the amount of error that you would have when you're trying to take the image. So as you can see from this, from the light rays over here, it is actually seeing a different image than what your lens is actually seeing. So you kind of have to pay a bit of attention, right? You have to pay a little bit of attention when you are taking an image using this type of camera, right? So usually that viewfinder can be seen in, film, in disposable film cameras or cameras like this, where the viewfinder is over here, right? And your lens would be here. So what you're technically seeing in your viewfinder isn't exactly what your lens will take. So you have to account for that, right? If you're taking a picture, just remember that it's just, <laughs> just remember that it is a bit lower than what it, you intended to be, right? Because your lens is actually over here and you're viewing it from a bit above it, right? So you just have to keep that in mind when you're using cameras like these. Okay, so next, an interesting 
viewfinder camera is called the view camera. So this camera is interesting because as you can see, there's not really a viewing part, right? So where do you actually see, okay? So what, how you would use a view camera is in this part, right? At the back part, you would actually take that off. You would slide that off, right? And you can actually see what your lens is is really seeing. Like you are going to put your head over here. Usually there's like covers and a curtain behind you and you would be, you know, like in under your blankets, like something like that, right? You're gonna cover yourself and you get to really see, you know, where you wanna capture or what you wanna capture, right? Because now you're looking at exactly what the lens is seeing, right? And once you're done, you go out, you slide that back in and you expose your film. Your film would be here, the thing that you slid off. I think it would be film, right? So yeah, very interesting. It's cool, but it's still not exactly the best thing, right? Like how like it, it would be taking a bit of time just for you to capture any image. Right? You, you really have to like, oh my goodness. And even, the, and even much more because it's a lens, right? That image is inverted and it's just a bit too, it's a bit too hard to, you know, to, to, to put into thought. You have to imagine what you're seeing in a larger form, right? And next is a Twins Reflex camera. Now these are all the cool cameras that I saw um, even in real life. I had a chance to play around with this for a bit when I went to a museum. Was a museum, I forgot the name of it, but I was able to play around with this in such a way where the top part opens up. And the reason why there are two lenses is that one lens is your viewfinder lens and the other lens is the lens that is being exposed, right? So it, it'll be working like this, right? So firstly, the light would be entering through your first lens over here, and with use of a mirror, it goes up, right? To where you are going to be taking a picture from, right? So you would be, the way you would be using this technically, right? It's kind of awkward, right? Because you're, you're bending down and you're trying to see but because of the, the mirror that's here, you can see what that first lens is, is trying to capture, right? And the second lens, which is directly below, will be, ex be being exposed to the film, right? The words were correct. I really hope they were. But yeah, as you can see from this diagram, um, it's still a bit of an error, right? It's still not exactly the easiest thing because what you're seeing, you still have to account for that. You have to go a bit lower or higher accordingly based on where your subject is, right? It's still, it's still not the best. So after much, much experimentation, we are now coming to the more popular term or the more popular cameras these days, which is called the SLR. Now, uh, we have already talked about what a camera is, right? Maybe some of you here have already heard of DSLR cameras, right? When you go to a store, oh, look, these are DSLR cameras. So for those of you who don't know what SLR means, we're going to get right through it. So since we're still on the topic of viewfinders, the whole SLR part of the viewfinder, of the camera, sorry, is only dealing with the viewfinder, right? It's just it, single lens reflex. So the way this works, right, in most cameras of today, um, okay, not most cameras, but in SLR cameras of today, this is how it works, okay? So what it is <clears throat> in this diagram over here, what it is is when you, when you're trying to capture an image, the light rays, remember, from the very beginning, light rays, right? Dark room, lens, light entering. Mm. <laughs> when light is entering, it will first hit a mirror that will be placed in front of the shutter, go up, it will direct light upwards into a prism that will direct light into the viewfinder. All right, now I have to illustrate this to make it easier to understand. So. I'm going to bust out my film camera here again. So I open this up. All right. So 
can I get a zoom in here? <laughs> All right. So this is actually an SLR camera, an SLR film camera. And over here, over here, whoa, right? Over here, right? Do you see this? This is the mirror that will go up when I take a picture. All right? So what is happening is that when I go up with this, okay? When I take a picture, this whole mirror will go up. So that technically, when light is entering in to the camera, that light will be hitting this mirror, going up and into a prism that is over here, over here, and I will be seeing exactly what the lens is seeing. All right, so I hope that's easy to understand. So whenever you open up an SLR camera, the first thing you will see is a mirror. And this mirror, <clears throat> this mirror once again, will be directing light from the lens, right, into the camera, hits the mirror, goes up, plays around the prism, and comes out into the viewfinder. So what is happening is what you see is what you will get. So finally, now there's no more room for error, right? And you will really see what you are capturing. So whenever you start to see SLR cameras, that is what it's all about. The mirror directing light to the viewfinder so that so that you can really see what you're capturing with the lens. So now you know what you're capturing is accurate, right? It is accurate. <laughs> okay, so just to explain it a bit more, in a single lens reflex camera, or SLR for short, right? So what's happening is when you enter, so I'm gonna bring up my highlighter, when light enters in, it goes up, goes in, up, plays around in the prism, goes to your eyes, and then now you're going to be composing and focusing your image, right? It plays around over there. When you click the shutter button, the shutter, whoops, <laughs> the shutter goes up, the mirror goes up, and a special sound will be played, right? The shutter sound <laughs> when you're exposing it. Again, like really just for, for purposes of this, this is the sound that will, that will be played to make it more ASMR like. I don't know if you guys heard that, but that, that, that was it. I'll do it one more time. <laughs> oh, this is pretty cool, man. I'm kind of geeking out. <laughs> All right, so that is what an SLR is in a DSLR, or sorry, an SLR camera. All right, so the reason why D is there is D, that D stands for digital. All right, so when you say SLR camera, sometimes you can be talking about the manual ones, um, the ones that don't use sensors yet, right? So this is an example of a manual SLR camera. So the reason why it's manual is you are controlling everything literally manually, right? So your focus, right? There's no autofocus. You gotta do it yourself. The aperture setting, you got to move that, you got to move the opening, you got to adjust it accordingly. The shutter, you got to set it on a dial, everything is all manual. So even today, actually, if the true test of a photographer's skill, right, if you really want to work on it, you got to learn how to capture images that are in manual mode, right? Because if you're not able to do that yet, it's you're just you know it's just more like you're doing it for fun and that's okay but if you want to up your game and you want to really take you know just a bit take it a bit more seriously you can learn so much by being able to use manual right to go in depth and to really study what how light plays around in your images because it's a it's a learning process i think if you're ever going to get into photography or if you are into photography there's just so much to learn how you can play around with light right and what you can do play around with colors play around with light there's just so much there and it's a beautiful world to enter and if you guys are going to enter it or you're already in it you know i want to collaborate 
meet you all if you're in the UAE. In the Philippines, sana I can <laughs> I can go over there, meet you all as well. But um, I love photography, and and whenever I get the chance to really you know share it and um, you know take pictures around with people, it's always very fun and exciting. So, okay, back to topic. Um, after this shift, you know, like I said, we are now seeing DSLRs kind of dominating the market at the moment. Digital SLR, the only difference from a digital SLR and an SLR is now the use of, okay, I won't say it's the only difference, but the sensors are now there, uh, different modes are there, the automatics and things like that, portrait mode, all these modes. You have an LCD screen, right? You have all of these new features. I won't go into too much detail about that, but all you need to know is that still, once again, the SLR part of the cameras is only dealing with the viewfinder, right? That's it, okay? So one thing, of course, a big mention is that now there is a rise of mirrorless cameras, right? So this is the removal of that SLR part and it's now everything is just done electronically and digitally because now your viewfinder that you are using is no longer using that mirror to direct light, it's gone. Because now that whatever you're seeing is still what you're gonna get. And the way that it's achieved is it's done electronically. So technically there is a sensor that is always being exposed such that whenever you wanna take a picture or shoot video, you already know what you're doing because it's already set there, right? It's the, 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 the removal of the mirror, right? The removal of the mirror made it so that this process is more seamless and so much easier. You can now have smaller bodies because everything is just done digitally, right? It's just done electronically. It's just done through the software. That's why mirrorless cameras are very expensive because you're removing physical parts in place of softwares and, you know, all those things that are hard to you know, hard to come by at this moment. So yeah, technology is improving every day and maybe who knows, maybe the next thing you're going to see is a very small box to be able to take pictures. I mean, that exists already, but you know, I really do feel like technology is advancing so fast and I can't wait to see where, you know, where the realm of photography is gonna take us, All right? So I think with that time check, it is currently 5.20. Whoa. Yeah, with that, um, I think I am going to conclude. I think this is our last slide. Yeah, it is our last slide. All right, so um, with that, of course, I need to make some honorable mentions of types of cameras. So there are point and shoots, which was mentioned earlier. Point and shoots are pretty simple cameras. Um, they're, they can range from film to digital cameras. And all it is is as it says in the name, you target what you want to take a picture of and you press the button and you're done, right? Um, another honorable mention, of course, are phone cameras. Yeah, I think that the newer phones are now um, adapting the, the features of being able to control your aperture, your shutter speed, and even your ISO, I didn't talk about ISO today. So to those of you who are wondering, where is that? We'll be talking about that next week. So don't worry, I will talk about what ISO is. Um, so you can control all of these cool things in the phone camera now. So just let it sink in. So everything I talked about, the camera obscura, the light entering in, images forming, film, all of that is a large piece of history and it has come down into your pocket. Isn't that something, right? If you just, you know, you just take a step back and realize where this all came from, you can start to, you know, appreciate the camera that is within your phone. Like it is amazing that now it just fitted for everyone to use. All you need to do, pull it out, swipe left, swipe right, click the button. You just captured something, right? A beautiful piece of history, right? It took so much, you know, so much to get to where it is. And it is always, you know, cool and amazing that people can capture beautiful moments with their families, with their friends, and to really, and 
what, what word did I use earlier? Eternalize? Yeah, to eternalize. <laughs> to eternalize the moments that you're experiencing within your lives. So, yeah, with that, um, I'll be concluding. So, of course, uh, for our webinar today, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, just a brief recap of what we covered over here today. So we talked about the camera obscura. Uh, once again, to those of you who just joined us or to those of you who are kind of forgot, <laughs> the camera obscura once again is a dark room or dark chamber wherein there is an opening or a hole on one side where light is allowed to enter. Once light is allowed to enter, an image will be forming on the screen that is on the opposite side of this opening. And that image would be upside down and reversed. All right, concept of camera obscura. Next, we talked about a brief history. So a couple of interesting people, Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, Joseph Nieps, uh, George Eastman, and William Henry Fox Talbot. Very interesting and amazing people who have contributed into the world of photography that we know today. Negative images, like I explained, um, whatever is dark will be light, whatever is light will be dark, right? And the camera, so stuff about it, the lens, the aperture, the viewfinder, and a couple of types of cameras. So we will be moving on. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming. So now, because we have a bit of time, I think now I can answer more questions. I see the chat popping up, so I'm gonna get to all the questions that we have here. So now I'm gonna move on to questions and answers. Uh, you know, shameless plug, this is my Instagram on the bottom left. You know, follow me guys. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna get to some of the questions here, right in the chat now. Okay. Whoa, all right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I will scroll up to where to where I last left off. Okay, so Adam, wait, no, before that, is it true that, okay, so I can see a, a question from Aisha Torrente Rapaka. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Rapaka. Rapaka. Is it true, Paul, that photography defines something much more like has a story behind it? This is really open to interpretation. And I think the way that you are um, telling me is, is it like an art form? Yes, photography is an art form. The photographs that you are taking can define things a lot more. The only thing I talked about today is kind of the theory behind it. And the images that we capture and the pictures that we have can really create different concepts so black and white photography for example is really interesting because it's just white and black and to be able to play around with shadows is so cool so you can create extremely dramatic images and they can just mean so much more right like you know maybe you want to show someone sad or someone happy right and you're going to make it so bright uh, there are so many things you can play around with and that's more about the artistic side of photography all right so yeah, I feel like there are, of course, stories behind photographs. So specifically, photojournalists are the people who really um, embrace that part of photography. So if you're into the news, you know, you're really up in the stories, right? You want to capture something that will tell enough for the viewer to understand what's going on. Like, for example, I won't, you know, mention too much, but there are some rallies out there here and there. And so for those photographers who have to be a part of the news, they really need to, you know, oh, you got to find the best shot to be used like in the headlines and stuff. So there are stories, of course, you can place stories behind cameras and pictures. So yeah, I think there is a lot of room for stories in photographs. Okay, so next. I'm using Photoshop, is that okay for my level? It is very okay. If, you're, if Photoshop is your beginning editing software, then you are like more than halfway there, bro. Like. Are you a bro, Adam? Adam Barreto, yeah. Uh, you're already halfway there, man, because that's like um, a more premium editing software that we can use. You can really play around with so many things, manipulate, and it's just a play around software. You can play around, right? And you can really do a bunch of things with your images. So yeah, it's okay. Um, for a beginner, 
even better because you're you're technically putting yourself in an unknown place and the learning possibilities are endless trust me even i'm still learning photoshop even though i know how to use it each time i open up the software there's always something i didn't know that i suddenly find out all right what camera am i currently using um right now what i have with me is the nikon d810 so that is a full frame camera um, i have a bunch of other cameras too like that fm10 for example that i just showed you guys yeah, I have a bunch of cameras with me, um, like a D5100. I'm a Nikon user, uh, low-key bias. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm using a Nikon D810 or D800, you know, whichever one, it's the same. Share tips on cleaning, storing, and carrying camera lens. Okay. Um, well, I think to to give a very clear analogy, you can treat your camera lenses like your glasses. All right, if you have a glass, if you're if you're wearing specs, um, it's easy to understand that if you always want to clean it, you need to be using um, a microfiber. All right, because the reason why you would use microfibers is it doesn't it doesn't like hold residue on the surface right? Because a microfiber technically is kind of, um, in a way, it's, it's like an extending, it's like hair, okay? So imagine your hair, right? So technically, the real surface that you are touching onto your lens is the tip of your hairs. And all of the residue that might have been on top of the, of your, whatever you're using to wipe, would actually be on your scalp, right? So similarly, the reason why you're using a microfiber, right, it doesn't, all the residue and surfaces, right, or sorry, all the residue is being stored in the inner surface and the upper side is what you're actually wiping. So just imagine fur, right, fur. It's not exactly the skin, it's the hair. So same thing, that's what a microfiber is. So use a microfiber, don't use tissue. It's very bad, you might scratch your, your lens, so not a good idea. If it's the only thing you have, okay, sure, but I really advise not to. Your shirt, very bad idea. Don't do it. Treat it like if you were to have your own glasses. Take care of it, okay? Use microfibers. If there's a liquid, sure, use that as well. Yeah, storing it um, and carrying it. Um, I don't think there's much for me to say other than make sure it's in a, in a fixed place. Make sure there's not much room for it to be moving so if you were to own a camera bag make sure everything is packed like even if you're putting whatever stuff your power bank make sure it's all or make sure you're removing the opportunities for things to move in your camera so that in your camera bag so that uh you won't have that that worry all right okay so there you go um carrying it carrying it leave it in your bag if you're carrying it I would advise not to always hold your camera lens and walk around because that is very dangerous. You might drop it. I know you can say like, oh, but I'm very confident, but you know, save yourself the risk, right? It would be better if you might have a, another bag to, ca to carry around the lens or keep it in your bag wherever it is. You know, I would advise to really make sure that there's nothing much moving around. Don't put it at risk. You know, think of it as like your little baby right? Like you don't want to, you know, put it in so much risk carrying it around with one hand while you're trying to take a picture. Like, oh, I feel so cool, you know, I'm, right? Uh, right. So make sure you're taking care of your camera lenses and uh, you're, you're using microfibers to wipe and keep it clean. Still crispy. Yeah, Dre. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. It brings back good memories, man. Of course. Um, everyone can take out the show. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you guys have cameras too, you know. Wait, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, we love film, yeah. Mm -hmm. A Polaroid camera. How does a Polaroid camera work? Okay, well, uh, I haven't really read much into a Polaroid camera, but if you still think about the fundamentals of what we talked about, so the camera obscura and everything, 
right? The image is already being formed on that film, right? So for example, I think Fujifilm is the more popular brand that we're seeing these days in terms of like Polaroids. So what is happening is that film, right? Is your recording medium, right? So when you take a picture, right? When you take a picture, a shutter will open and that film, which is technically full of, you know, it's coated with chemicals and things like that to record it, it will record it and then it will then get printed out, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a concept that I think that we don't really understand. I don't personally don't understand much of how the film is like being made. So why does it print? And then when you shake it around, you got to do that stuff. But um, just think about the fundamentals of what photography is. So recording medium, remember image being formed it's inverted, so that's why when you print it, so if you think about it, right, your film is technically, when you load it into a Polaroid, it's actually the wrong side up because that image is being formed invertedly. So when it prints out, it's printing out the right side up because that image is upside down. <laughs> yeah, so that's a bit of what I know about a Polaroid camera. You can treat it like a film camera if you want. I like Polaroids because you can really save the the part of printing and you can keep your, you know, your little Polaroids here and there, like moments about your life. I think it's a nice gift to give someone, you know, shout out. It's an amazing gift to give to someone if they're, you know, they're not really into photography, but you, you want them to have a chance to capture memories and stuff like that. You want to give them a gift give him a Polaroid camera. Little hacks. All right. All right. Um, as I go for more questions, I think we can. Um, um, okay, I think I'll try to speed up a bit more for each of these questions. Uh, when your shutter is fast, it will reduce the lights coming from the lens. Yes, it will. Um, I can go into more detail next week about how this works but if you set your shutter speed in such a way where it, it's really fast you're not letting so much light in correct vice versa if you were to use a longer shutter opening setting i, I got confused for a bit but if you allow yourself to expose your lens oh, sorry your sensor or film for a longer period of time more light gets to come in i can get to what your images will look like next week when you leave it long, like open up for too long and what are the cool situations you can find yourself in. It's just a bit of night photography, a little bit of a hint guys. If you want to use longer exposures, it's night photography. All right, next. Will we be able to see some of the pictures you took? Yeah, next week, I won't, uh, if it's in my Instagram, yeah, it's a couple of them. But next week, because I'm not really someone who posts a lot, next week I'll be showing a bit of my work here and there, some of the pictures I've taken, and I'll try to, um, I try to explain what I did during that time along the way with the settings that I used. And of course, we'll be talking about exposure composition and everything next week. So I hope to see you guys all there again, all right? The kinds of lenses, yes, I will. Yeah, yes, I will. A bit of it, yeah. Some bit of focal lengths. What, what are the different lenses you could use for different effects? I'll go into that as well, Jerome. Thank you. Uh, time and the beautiful evolution of a camel. Yep, it is a beautiful evolution. Is there any tips? Okay, is there any tips you can give to people that are starting with photography? starting with photography and found their passion in it. Oh. <laughs> Is there any tips you could give to people that are starting with photography? Well, um, I think in order for me to answer that, I'm going to share a bit more about myself. All right, so um, to, to make it very short, the way I entered photography when I was very young, I was a part of an organization called OOPS. So OOPS was called a, or stood for Overseas Pinoy Professional Photographer Society. And my dad was one of the, um, one of the founding members there. And, whoa. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, so my dad was one of the founding members there. And over there, I was able to enter when I was 10 years old. No, sorry. 10 years old was when I started taking a class there. And that's when I kind of entered into the photography scene properly. Sure, I was there for much longer before that, but I was very young. And the reason why I got into photography again, because I kept it on hold for a lot of years, the reason why was because, um, funny enough, there was a competition that was out there and my dad just told me, hey, you know, like, uh, why, why don't we join this? Like, we have cameras. You're in, you remember how to take pictures again. So I said, okay, sure, why not? So I went out with my dad. We went for a couple of photo walks here and there. And I took a couple of pictures. Um, we went here, we went there. I took pictures, I submitted them. And well, one thing led to another and somehow I became finalists for like that specific competition I joined. And that was pretty amazing. And when that happened, I started to realize like, whoa, right? Like somehow I was able to be recognized for something that I kind of left behind, right? And in a way, I got the ball rolling and I started to join a couple more competitions here and there. I started posting a couple of my pictures and I started telling stories like, hey, I'm starting to use a camera. I brought my camera to school and everything just started to fall into place. I started to get recognized. Um, there were some magazines who featured me as well, like Ilya Strada, for example. And yeah, it's it's been a cool journey. So if I were to give you guys a tip, especially those who are starting off, it's it really comes down to just taking a picture right you can start with your phone like it's really not that difficult and when you usually pair it up with someone with you because for me i had my dad and it was very easy but if you can start that journey with someone like taking pictures with a group of friends or maybe you might want to have a mentor or something you add another person into the mix you can make your learning journey so much better why because you also get the opportunity to share share the stories that you have uh, how you took this image why are you so proud of it because there's just a big world out there for art so like when you consider photography as well as an art form there's really a lot of things you can do and to get yourself started all you really need is the interest hopefully i was able to interest some of you today like we've been talking for a while and with everything I said, how a camera works, maybe now you can really uh, jump into the world of photography, take pictures, and along the way, you will learn new things and you want to, you know, you would want to experiment. Oh, how did he take that photograph? Oh, I want to learn. I'm going to look up a YouTube video. Oh, that's how he did it. Let me try it. Wash, rinse, and repeat that process. So, yeah, if you're just finding your passion with it now, you know what, I believe in you. Uh, if you want to collaborate, if you're in the UAE, you know, hit me up, right? Like we can, okay, sure, there's a pandemic right now, but I'm, of course, always ready to share a bit of what I know with you. And yeah, you send me a DM or whatever it is. I'd be happy to help you in your photography journey. Or if you want to share about ideas and whatever, we can. Okay. Is there, if there's time, will you share some of your personal work? We'd love to hear stories. Oh, yeah, I think next week would be the best thing for that, my bro, Ed Trey. Yeah, next week would be a good time for that. I have a Sony Cybershot DSC H300 camera. Wow, I need to look that up. Can we get a, can we look that up in the chat? <laughs> uh, a Sony, okay, let me write that down. I'm going to look that up later. And if you're here next week, I will, can you have a pen? Right. If you're here next week, I can answer that question for you. So I'll just keep a, I'll just write this down and answer that for you. Sony Cybershot DSC H300 camera. Okay. What was your inspiration? My inspiration <laughs> okay, well, I think I kind of explained that already. I think my inspiration has always been the people around me. Like I said, uh, my dad was a very big part of that. Uh, it was because of his push and his influence on me because he was a photographer himself. All of the equipment that we have was his. 
And so he was kind of the person to introduce me and take me alongside him into, well, where this world we are in now. So I really got inspired by my dad. And then now I am finding like other people to look for, for inspiration, like those who are, you know, in YouTube, in arts and everywhere, the artsy photographers and whatnot. Like you just start to explore. So for me, it really had to come down to family, right? And that's where everything started. Okay. Mm. What made you love photography? Yeah, it was my dad. Manifest <laughs> us. Mm, yes. If I were to buy a camera as a starter, what are the features we need to consider in choosing one? Oh, very good question. Um, a starter camera. Okay. So the first thing I think that you need to consider is your budget. <laughs> It is your price, it's the price tag. It's what are you willing to spend on buying a camera? You know, realistically speaking, cameras can range from very cheap to very expensive, right? So it really comes down to how much are you willing to spend? Are you going to be doing it professionally? Like, do you, want, do you see yourself doing that eventually? Or you just want to, you know, take a couple of pictures here and there, you know, casually, like it really depends. So if I were to, suggest my personal recommendation of what you can look for are point and shoot cameras because i think in order to get the basis down of well, not even point and shoot cameras are just like phone cameras in a way so if you want to start off i would suggest an slr camera to really get the fundamentals of using all of these concepts so the lens work the focusing the shutter speed control the iso and all of that you can find yourself doing well with an SLR camera because it's already easier to use. Your viewfinder is already correct. Um, it can be digital. It can be film. If you really want to have the best learning experience, that's the best that I can recommend to you. Of course, the models and stuff, we can get to that later, but start looking for entry-level cameras. I think there's a Wikipedia page for that. Entry-level cameras, that's where you can start to begin you know, looking at what you can afford to buy for your needs. You know, at the end of the day, you can also use your phone, right? Like, <laughs> that's also what you can use. Okay, next question. What is the one thing you wish you knew when you started taking photos? Wow, that's making me think. Okay, the one thing that I wish I knew, the one thing I wish I knew when I was taking photos was how to was how aperture worked. Because <laughs> when, when I was very young and I started taking photographs, I didn't know what aperture did. And it was so weird for me, like, oh, aperture is like, you know, the opening, yeah? But it doesn't really do much for my photographs. So I remember I took a test in my class that time, a very long time ago. And I was indeed like very confused, like, wait, how, how, does, how, does, how does that, how does it go out of focus? But the person close by is in focus. <laughs> like it's a very small simple thing but i didn't know how, what aperture meant until so much later like maybe like five to six years later was when i really figured out what aperture was right like oh my god i don't know how to use this <laughs> so what i was only playing around with was the shutter speed and the iso like i only used those two when i was starting off i didn't use aperture at all like i was so scared of using it like but when i reduce the number it it makes it bigger that makes no sense that if it should go small the the opening should also be small right that just simple logic <laughs> so yeah that was me <laughs> yeah um yeah i think we can officially conclude by 6 p.m yeah, because that is the, or not 6 p.m., maybe maybe five more minutes, I'll answer a couple more questions and then we can conclude today. All right. Five to seven, uh, maybe 5.45, hopefully. Do you have any photographers that inspire you? What have you learned from them? Mm. Okay, so 
I remember uh, it's it's so sad that I haven't mentioned his name, but there was a an exhibition recently in the UAE which was called Exposure, and I remember when I went there, there were just so many photographs of different of different you know people that were just displayed. It was a legitimate exhibit, and I feel so sad that I didn't write it down. I know it's a picture. I, I remember I took a picture of that photographer. Um, of that photographer's name on my phone, I gotta find it. But um, if there was one thing that I got really inspired from in that exhibition was nature and wildlife. Like nature and wildlife photography is really something cool because you really connect with the world. And what I wanted to always do was whenever I get the chance to travel, hopefully whenever I get a chance to travel again, I really want to go on those like hiking trips and you know, get to see waterfalls and wildlife and things like that. Because I feel like I get to really connect with the stuff I don't get to see every day. So this for this photographer in particular, he was a National Geographic photographer and his work was displayed all throughout in a big room. And I was just so shocked at what he was able to capture. Like, wow. I really, I'm so sad I forgot his name, but I really, thanks for reminding me, actually. I really have to look for him. But he was a National Geographic photographer. So I love nature, guys. Hopefully, you know, away from the city of the UAE, I want to travel the world. If you want to talk or share something. Oh, yeah. I think that would be better. Um, tips and tricks inspirations okay yes using camera cases yes camera cases are good please use them take care of your cameras um when is the right time to use flash i'll get to that next week will you be able to talk about different photography compositions yes i will also get to that next week so exposure and comp composition guys that will be discussed next week because i left that out for today a group a group Oh yeah, guys. I mean, that would be pretty amazing if we can create a group, a community of those who are here and we can just share stuff and really, you know, find ourselves in an awesome place. What camera do you suggest for a beginner? Okay, I think I answered that. Entry level cameras are the best. What is your favorite subject to shoot? At the moment, I love to shoot people. I love looking at the different you know, we all live different lives and I really like meeting new people. So to be able to photograph them at the moment, this is my main interest. I love portraits. So if you want to have your picture taken by me, you know, <laughs> hit me up. I love doing portraits at the moment. It's my current interest and I want to see where, what else I can do with it. What are the traits a photographer should have? A willingness to learn, a passion for it, and to never give up. That's the number one thing because you're always going to be facing um, frustrations. So just like any skill that you're trying to learn, of course, you need to first enjoy what you're doing. Make sure that you are ready to sacrifice for it and always look ahead. Take every step with you know full confidence don't look at the end goal all right away you know and it's a step-by-step -step process right if you want to go for something if you want to be the best photographer in the world start small and work your way you know that's the best trait i can say so hard work um resilience always willing to learn and i think those are just the two specific ones i want every photographer to have willingness to learn and always resilient never backing down Which phone has a better camera? <laughs> uh, there's, that's a debatable question. At the moment, I would say Google. <laughs> you know, it's not even there, right? <laughs> but yeah, Google has a pretty cool camera, the way they do it because of their software and how it works. Because phone cameras are in unison with software use. Right? The way that you use a phone camera now, is, it's really in combination of how well they do their software. And if you're looking for a really good camera, Google is your best bet. It's the best camera in the business at the moment, right? 
is better than an iPhone, is better than Samsung, is better than Huawei. But Google is not really available in the UAE, so that's unfortunate. But if I were to choose between these three, I'm an Apple user, so kind of biased. I would go for iPhone. <laughs> I would go for iPhone personally. But Samsung and Huawei have done really cool things with their cameras as well. But I think it's just the way that I like my software. So. <laughs> Does expensive cameras mean better results? No, it really does not. Expensive cameras does not mean better results. In fact, you can s create so much beautiful stuff using this film camera. This is now worth almost a fraction of what it was before, right? You can get amazing results. It's never the camera, right? And that's what you always hear. It's never the camera, it's always the photographer. But I know that's too cliche, so I'll keep it easier to, or not easier, I'll give you a goal to have in mind, is that whenever you're looking in terms of equipment, always look for the lens. The lens is what does a lot of the work. It's not the camera, it's not the camera body, it's the lens. We have a lot of questions here, guys. Let's do something. I went to exposure. Oh yeah, awesome. Cool, yeah, hopefully we'd have exposure again. After the pandemic, Sana, you know, we want some photo walks. Phil Sock, uh, shout out Sana, please. <laughs> all right, so I think I got to all of the questions. So if there's anything else, or uh, maybe if there's anything else that we can talk about, I think I answered all the questions so far. Or if there's any more, like I think I can spare maybe two more minutes, maybe one more question. But if there's nothing else anymore, um, yeah. Yeah, I think the floor is open. If anyone, if anyone wants to open their microphone, to make sure if you want to say something. Yeah, if there are some uh, attendees who would like to ask questions. Otherwise, uh, we will now uh, have our final photo oops who has survived the uh, almost three hour session. By the way, uh, you have plotted some question to our speakers, but uh, also he will give you some questions to answer before the session too. So everybody will be uh, sent some questionnaire, what they have learned from this session before they can continue the next week's session. So that is the proof. And then after uh, you have uh, sent that answers, then we will be sending you the link of the next session. Hopefully, you have learned something. Anyway, uh, uh, this uh, session is uh, recorded and we will be uh, sending you the copy so that you can review. But don't copy with each other, of course. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, I, I think uh, Colin, can you put the uh, shared sharing to me so everybody can now uh, uh, open their uh, video so we can have, we have the final photos. Yeah, yeah. So, sure. Yeah, so. Uh, also, uh, I would like to make an announcement uh, to, if you have any suggestions for a webinar subject or topic, of course, feel free to uh, suggest, inform your teachers, or you can directly message or email us at info at filipinosocialclub.com. Uh, we have some uh, upcoming topics here like uh, leadership training, public speaking, young entrepreneurship, cooking, baking, first aid, some guitar lessons, of course, filmmaking, blogging, and uh, of course, Feel free to follow and visit our social media page. Or our Facebook account is uh, Filipino Social Club. Our Instagram is uh, Filipino Social Club. Our Twitter is at Filipino Club UAE. Our YouTube account is Filipino Club, a Filipino Social Club. And our website is uh, www.filipinosocialclub.com. Okay. Well, Sir of course. Uh, Yes. Sir, what about robotics? 
Okay, that's a good suggestion. So we will consider your robotics. And uh, of course, uh, we will look for uh, some specialists for, for these things. So we will be able to, to uh, view that. Okay, so I, I asked the help of uh, Milo to take pictures of the survivors of, of this uh, event. So those who are able not, there will be no more uh, additional attendees for this since uh, it, the session one is related to session two. So now uh, uh, the confirmations of your attendees, attendance on the next session will be your reply to the questionnaire that the lecturer has presented. So anybody more? And so everybody is, has opened now the uh, uh, their video. I think so. Also, we of course we will be coordinating the uh, your schools and showcase uh, our uh, during the Expo 2020 because the Philippine Social Club is uh, involved in these activities. Of course, in the year 2021. Of course, uh, we want to see you personally after this pandemic. Uh, we will be organizing and uh, meeting all of you for street photography sessions, or we will be visiting your uh, respective schools or universities, but not in the Philippines. I know there are some uh, attendees who are uh, at, who has attended from the Philippines. So now, uh, uh, Milo, can you uh, okay. take a photo? All the attendees, it's, all, it's already taken. So okay. these are the survivors of the session one. Uh, some has left, and I know. But uh, and thank you very much for the nice presentation uh, of uh, Colin. And uh, I hope uh, you will be having another uh, exciting session next week. Well, of course, uh, I'm your moderator for the day, Engineer Dante Deliso. I'm one of the founder and a uh, board of directors of Filipino Social Club. Also, in behalf of my fellow uh, board of directors, of course, our president, Eric Reyes, I would like also to, to, to welcome our uh, legal advisor, Mr. Alan Bakason, who is also on the attendance. Well, yeah. So, anything to add, uh, our president, Mr. Erickson, before we close? Uh, that's it. No, again, uh, everyone, let's give a uh, give a clap, no, to uh, Engineer Dante Deliso, our coordinator. And I am very happy to see everyone here. As I said, no, that uh, we are open for any suggestions. We will coordinate with your schools, and hopefully, after the pandemic, we will all meet together. Especially, we'll be having a big event, so we'll all meet together. Let's pray for that. Okay. We agree on that. And don't forget to follow our Filipino Social Club and hope everyone can join us at the PILSOC Youth Club. Okay? For the information, Filipino Social Club is a license. We are a legal organization under the Dubai government. So we are very grateful. Lahat ng Filipino, if India has Indian Club, Pakistan, Pakistan Club, this is our club, Filipino Social Club. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you very much and uh, have a good day and good luck and see you soon next week. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. 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 Yeah, okay. So uh, see you next week. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And thank you, Milo. Thank you. Hi. Congrats, Colin. Congrats, Colin. Bye.